experience this worship service. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Can we stand for a word of prayer, please? God, we thank you for this day. We thank you for all that you're doing in our lives. Thank you for what you've already done and what you're about to do. Uh, heal us, God, and touch our bodies, touch our minds, those of us who are tired. Uh, be with us and guide us. Give us strength right now. Bless everybody that's in here, God, and those who are on their way. Have your way in this service right now, and we will forever give you the praise. We say thank you tonight. We say thank you tonight. Thank you, Jesus, for everything. Now, Lord, forgive us for our sins and protect us from all anxieties. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Clap your hands in this place. This is a little song to open it up. Come on, everybody. I just want to pray.
Any worshipers in the building? Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I dare you to open your mouth and let them have it. Come on, he appreciates this. He loves this. This is what you were created to do. Give it to him. Give it to him. Hallelujah. We bless your holy name, Lord. It's here I am to worship. Here I am to bow down. Here I am to say that. Come on, say it. All over the house, say it. You're all all together. Wonderful. Come on, say it again. Say, here I am, here I am. Hallelujah. Yes, Lord, say, here I am. You're, you're all together, yeah. Everybody, come on, say, here I am, yeah.
Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him in the building. Let's give him glory. Let's thank God for another opportunity to gather as the saints of God. Thank God for this leadership that is in here and all of you who have joined us. Come on, let's go to God in prayer. God, we bless you and we thank you. We love you, oh God. We thank you for this moment in the midweek as we gather to study your word, as we gather to hear from you, oh God. We pray for those who are yet on the way. We pray for those who are here. We pray for the word, God, as we begin the, this discussion of this book of Daniel. Lord, help us to hear in this letter what is for us in this season and right now. Lord, we pray for this coming Saturday, and we pray for all of the mothers, and we pray for all of the babies, and we pray for the Maternal Health Summit, and we pray for impact on their lives. Now, God, as we turn to hear a word from you, I have studied, but I need your strength, prepared, but I need your power, willing, and I want to, but only you can make me able. Silently now, I wait for thee, ready, my Lord, thy will to see, open mine eyes, and illumine me spirit divine amen amen and amen amen let the people of god say amen if you love the lord say amen again glad to be here tonight say amen one more time so we bless and thank god for all of you that are here to study the word of god uh, i want you to know about an opportunity for those of you that are watching online or for those of you that are in here if you're interested one of the goals that we have this year in reset uh, we want everyone to find a group uh, to be a part of so that you can go even deeper in study. Um, let me explain. I think that what we're going to do tonight, I think that I teach um, at a, a pretty deep level. I think that it is a wonderful opportunity, but there's one piece that's missing in here, and that is the dialogue. This is more of a lecture. This is more of an information dump. And your own journey will require, at some point, you begin to sit with others and have dialogue and have um, question and answer. Uh, because part of growing, particularly adult learning, um, is associated with uh, small group, conversation, uh, all of that. And one of the goals uh, in the church would be to connect you both online and um, uh, in person with one of our associate ministers who will be uh, having small group Bible studies as well. And so, you know, 20 years ago, we would have called it cell groups. Uh, that was the thing that we were calling it. But it, it, it's an opportunity for you uh, to, again, build community. Uh, I think that Sunday morning is the block party. And, uh, and Tuesday nights, quarterly, is another opportunity for us to uh, have a quieter block party. Uh, and then, but then there's an opportunity for you to be in small group Bible study. If you're interested, you can text GROUP, G-R-O-U-P, to 53502. If you text GROUP to 53502, uh, you will be led in a process that can get you to small group. There's been a method to the madness of January. Every January, we do the 31-day biblical challenge, and you are exposed to the associate ministers and their teaching. Um, if you've been doing 31-day challenge now for the last four or five years, what you should know by now is that all of our associate ministers are able. Uh, they do a great job. They can rightly divide the word of God. And you would be blessed to be in a uh, small group situation with them. And um, I'm excited about it. And um, so we want you to know about that. So we gather on Sundays for worship periodically when we get together. Because tonight is as much about what happened before and what will happen after as it is about our conversation. Um, but then there's an opportunity for you to be in a smaller group um, to chew on it a little more. And so we want you to know about that. So thank you very, very much. Please, moms and dads, don't forget about this weekend, uh, the Maternal Health Summit that is just blowing up off the chains. If you didn't bring anything tonight and you have not been able to do so yet, we still got a couple of days uh, we could use the diapers and the wipes 
and the bottles and all of that. We are expecting 200 babies. Uh, and so we're throwing showers for those who don't get showers. We're throwing showers for those uh, who don't have the resources. No child is going to leave here uh, without what they need. And we want to thank God for uh, the leadership of Sister Alexa, and she is doing a wonderful job with that. And for all those who are part of Deaconess Young for the beginnings of this thing uh, and the way that we have uh, grown, and I bless God for that. Uh, I don't tire in telling the story. I didn't know what a doula was. I never heard of it until Morgan had one, and I saw the benefit, and we wanted to develop that ministry here uh, and then we want to just love on mothers. It is an indictment on Philadelphia that we have both CHOP and high infant mortality rate in the African-American community. There's, there's something just fundamentally wrong about that, uh, that black babies are dying differently in the United States. Um, so we want to keep that in our prayers. Well, tonight we're going to start a conversation with a familiar book, um, but I want to I want to talk about it from a leadership perspective. I want to talk about it from a perspective of uh, why things happen to communities and how God raises up leaders for such a time. The importance uh, and the role. I want. I think this will lead us into a conversation around. Um, the tradition of the talented 10th uh, that I'd like to update the language and talk about not necessarily the talented 10th, but a committed quorum. Uh, and uh, I want to raise those issues. So we're, we're reading the book of Daniel. Daniel is considered one of the minor prophets that um, was doing his ministry during the exile and that is the Babylonian exile. It is believed that Daniel was a prophet to the um, Hebrew people while the, for the totality of the time that they were in Babylonian exile. In fact, you'll read that it says that Daniel ministered until the time of Cyrus, and Cyrus is the king that helped release the Jews out of Babylon. And just very quickly, um, for, for those of you who are still scratching your head about how some evangelical, well, a lot of evangelicals can hang on to President um, to Trump, uh, is one of the things they bake up in their mind is they believe that he is a modern-day King Cyrus. And the reason that they believe that is because of what when he named um, Jerusalem the capital, uh, where, where, when he put the uh, embassy in Jerusalem, uh, that said volumes to them about uh, being on the side of the Israelis. And King Cyrus fits a, a, a mode that they think Donald Trump is in. King Cyrus was a horrible man who only did one good thing, and that one good thing was he freed the Jews from Babylon. So you have a whole group of evangelicals who, who hold on to that. That's how they get around all the other foolishness. I think it's, it's irresponsible the, theology and it's crazy, but that's how they do it. But what we're talking about tonight is why does God let some things happen and how does God then deal with them? One of the things that we believe about when God lets your enemy win, when you're doing all the binding and loosing and praying and God is not stopping it, God is letting it happen to you and you're his child. What we believe theologically um, about the Old Testament and New Testament teaches that whenever God is letting your enemy win, it's because there's something in you that he's going to fix and or change. And there is also something in you that needs to change, repent, or um, come to God about. I'm, I'm, I'm choosing my words because I don't want anybody to feel judged. But at the same time, I think I need to remember when God does not change it for me, it's because he's working on changing me. 
when God, I, I know enough about God that he'll, he'll not let anything harm me. I know enough about God that he loves me. So then when I'm praying, God, move this thing and he doesn't move it or God lets the enemy win is because there's something in my life that God wants to change. There's something in my life that is displeasing. There is something that I need to address. That does not mean God loves the other side more than me. It means that God is using that to purge me. Is that all right? So here it is. D Daniel verse 1 in the first chapter. In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, unto his hand. See that language? And the Lord gave Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar and some with the vessels of the house of God. And he brought them to the land of Shinar to the house of his God and placed the vessels in the treasury of his God. In other words, God let Nebuchadnezzar win. And that causes you, you know, God, how you do that when the Hebrew people are your people? Can I talk to you a little bit about Jehoiakim? And this, this will maybe cause you to think about who you call leader and what you line up under. Um, Jehoiakim, according to rabbinical literature, dis is described as a godless tyrant who committed atrocious sins and crimes. He is portrayed as living in incestuous relationships with his mother, daughter-in-law, and stepmother and was in the habit of murdering men whose wives he would then violate and whose property he would seize. He also had a lot of tattoos on his body. Now, I'm not saying the tattoos displease God. I'm just, everybody chill out. It was just another little fact to know and to tell. But the point being, Jehoiakim, who was a son of Josiah, who was a king that God was pleased with, was not pleased with Jehoiakim was not pleased with his leadership. And because of him, it impacted all of Israel. This is the thing that, and I, I promise I'm not gonna be but so um, political tonight, but the reality is it blows my mind. We all, we all who teach Christian leadership, we all believe this same thing about the nature of a thing can be impacted by the leadership of a thing. One of the reasons why I said tonight, I, I want these Bible studies, I want our leaders to be here and everybody else is there because we have to remember, we shape what happens in here. If you are a minister, if I'm the pastor, if you're a deacon, a trustee, uh, who we are shapes the context. And it is very clear that when God is displeased, now nobody is perfect, but there is a difference between not being perfect and just being ratchet. There's, there's a difference. There, there, there really is a difference. And Jehoiakim is a ratchet. And, and Jehoiakim does not please God. And that filters down. This is what blows my mind about my evangelical friends. We know this stuff. We know the danger of having a leader like Donald Trump. We know the danger of that foolishness. But then the question is, so then why does God allow it? Why did God allow it back then? Why did God allow? Why has God allowed sometimes seemingly the enemy to win? Because when there's something about who you are, where you are, what you're in that is displeasing to God, God will do surgery in order to redeem you. God will let it get hot in your life in order to get you where God would have you to be. Now there's somebody in here who has some gray hair who can admit that there have been some place, things in your life that you didn't leave on your own, God had to blast you out. You, you, you could have left on your own, but you didn't leave on your own. So God had to turn up the heat, turn up the stuff until you had to get out. We won't even name what the it was, and we won't name what in was, we won't name where out was. We're just saying sometimes God will shake some things up. And in this, what we're seeing in this first section of Daniel, but what we're going to also see 
is God moving, God pointing out the problem, but God also raising up the answer. In this first seven verses, we're going to see God pointing out the problem, Jehoiakim. God addressing it by allowing Nebuchadnezzar to seemingly win. But in this same context, God begins to raise up an answer. See if we can see it. Then the king commanded Ashpenaz, his chief eunuch, to bring some of the people of Israel, both of the royal family and of the nobility, youths without blemish of good appearance and skillful in all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and competent to stand in the king's palace and to teach them the literature and language of the Chaldeans. The king assigned them a daily portion of the food that the king ate and of the wine that he drank. They were to be educated for three years, and at the end of that time, they were to stand before the king. Among these were Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, of the tribe of Judah. And the chief of the eunuchs gave them names. Daniel he called Belshazzar. Hananiah he called Shadrach. Mishael he called Meshach. And Azariah he called Abednego. Now we know these stories and most of us have grown up hearing these stories. And we almost think of, of the Daniel story and the Shadrach, Meshach, and the bad Negro story is all about. That's still funny after 30 years. And we're so used to it because we've grown up, but there's a whole lot of teaching in here about how God, how God heals, how God raises up, how God heals communities. So in this moment, there's something going on in Israel that is not pleasing to God, and God allows the enemy to win. The point that I need to remember is that whenever God is allowing the pressure in my life to win, I must ask myself, God, what do you want me to learn? God, what do you want me to change? Now, please understand, that does not mean that you are somehow a horrible person and you don't need to feel like a victim and you don't need to feel like God doesn't love you. In fact, the fact that God is giving you opportunity to change is sign of his love. Sign of his love is that he's not going to let you stay in that God forsaken position. The fact that that God loves you is because he's not going to let you stay in Jehoiakim and continue to live like that because he knows what the end is for you. And so he is going to blast you out. Let me see if I can make it plain. 35 years ago, you could not tell me that I was going to pastor anybody. And you could not tell me that I was not going to be Walter Malone's minister of music for the rest of my life. I was fine with living in Louisville, Kentucky and playing the organ at the Canaan Missionary Baptist Church and being Walter Malone's minister of music. And you could not tell me that it was going to be anything different than that. And ultimately, I love Walter Malone, and, 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 and you, all, you know, he comes every year now. But in the first few years that I was here, he wasn't here, right? You, I mean, you, you, you saw him maybe one time, but, but he wasn't here in those first few years. Now, the backstory of that is Walter Malone and I had fallen out. And we had a falling out, and I'll tell you the whole story. The whole story is this. Walter Malone came to me and said, you know, uh, my second year playing for him, and he said, uh, I'd like for you to be my minister of music. I was the organist. He said, I, I want to make you my minister of music. I said, yes. He said, but I need you to give me a five-year post-MDiv commitment to being my minister of music. I don't, you know, I know you're getting ready to get your degree. I want you getting your degree and leaving. And I was like, you ain't got to worry about that. I, I'll do it. I ain't pray. I ain't ask God. He did, I got this job. I was like, yes. So I'm the minister of music. 
So my final year, I get married to Ellen, and the Lord starts talking to me about pastoring. And I'm like, but I, I told Walter I'm staying here for another five years. So now I got this invitation to preach in Pennsylvania, and it was an invitation to come to Denora to preach just to be considered, not even to be called. Walter said, well, if you go, I'm going to have to look for another minister of music. I'm like, dude, how you going to frisk me, man? I mean, that, that's what we used to say. How you going to frisk me? I'm like, I can't believe you said, I, I didn't say they called me. I'm just going to preach. Said, no, no, you, you go. You roll in the dice. I'm like, is he really doing that to me? All of a sudden, I'm looking at him side-eyed. I'm playing the organ on Sunday morning. He's looking at me side-eyed. Because I did. I told him I would stay. But I ain't pray about it. I really didn't. All I knew is I wanted to play that organ for him. Then the Lord began to bother me about pastoral ministry. He began, and Walter and I hurt each other. One of the reasons why I try to have a different conversation with associates today is because I learned a lesson in that moment. But I also knew this. I wasn't leaving Louisville, Kentucky if the Lord didn't blast me out. It was both a call to, it was a call to Pennsylvania along with being uncomfortable with Pastor Malone. Now here's what's true. He was 35 and I was 24. We were both immature and we were both learning. And what God did, what blew my mind, what God did is uh, Pastor Malone said, well, you know, you, I'm going to look for a minister of music and we're going to see if this church calls you. If I find a minister of music before the church calls you, well, you out. And if you find, if that church calls you and I don't have a minister of music, uh, well, well, we'll be out. The Lord brought another man, Pastor Keith Hunter, and brought him so seamlessly that me and Keith played together for a month at Enon. And Enon never, uh, not Enon, um, at Canaan. Canaan never missed a beat. I never missed a beat. I went on to Pennsylvania. But in the moment, it was uncomfortable. And if I'll be honest, it took us about seven, eight, ten years to kind of get it out of our system. Um, but all of that was necessary to get here. All of that was necessary. And we both, I mean, we laugh about it now. He's one of the closest men on the planet to me, and we laugh about it. But I wouldn't have got out of there if it hadn't gotten rough. I wouldn't, he wouldn't have grown as a pastor. I would not have grown, and I would not have been be ready to then pastor who I am pastoring. I need you to hear that because what would have been a shame is if we both just ignored what God said, and I tried to just hold on to being a minister of music because God had so much more. Are you listening? Next time things get uncomfortable, you ought not assume that God is punishing you. You ought to assume God is doing something here, but he's using the stuff of life to get me to where I need to be. Are you with me? But in this, what we do know is God wants something different for Israel. God wants something different for the Hebrews. And now, now they are in captivity. But while they are in captivity, God is already working on the answer. God raises up. So what ne King Nebuchadnezzar is going to do is he takes over. And now he's going to, he thinks he's getting some slaves. But he's going to bring these people in. And so we know the story is Daniel. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, what's important about this, we usually hang on to the Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego language, but those are the names they were given. Those were the names they were given, their Babylonian names. What's important is that they never forget Hananiah Belche uh, and Daniel. They never, for they never forget their real names. Because what they recognize is that they were on assignment. Now, remember how they get there. Nebuchadnezzar says, I need you to go find me some educated, polished, let me lead, um, uh, read the language, youths without blemish, of good appearance, 
skillful, all wisdom, endowed with knowledge, understanding, learning, and comforted to stand in the king's place. God, so what happens in this moment is these are some of the people that are going to be used to help the children of Israel in the context of their Babylonian captivity, but they have to be prepared to be able to do it. Are you with me? They're not just any old people. These guys are educated. They're prepared. They're chosen by God. I'm not saying everybody has to be educated, but I am saying everybody has to be prepared for what God is calling you to do. Are you with me? And God is going to use Daniel. God is going to use Hananiah, Shad, uh, well, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. He is going to use all of them for his glory. Are you with me? Now, what they were called out for and what we appreciate, and we, of course, we're going to talk about the uh, Daniel fast a little bit tonight. But what Daniel reminds us is that he may have been given a new name, but he never forgot who he was. Are you with me? They took these four guys, bring them and start feeding them from the king's table and educating them uh, in the Chaldean language. That's what they're there for three years. For three years, they learned the ways of Babylon. Now, it's going to be important because they're part of God's deliverance, but they never forgot where they came from. Ooh, we got to stay right there. Some of us need to recognize that part of what the church is supposed to help all of us remember, just because you get elevated and just because you get educated and just because you gain access, don't forget who you are. Don't forget where you came from. And even if you personally, and let me see if I can make this thing plain. Not every African American black colored Negro person came out of the projects. Amen. Amen. So I don't want you to hear me saying everybody has been in the project and now you live in Abington. That's not what I'm saying. What I am saying is we are the people who were brought over here on the underside of the ships. We are descendants of slaves, kings and queens before that. But we in this country are the stony, the road we trod people. And even though you may not be on such a stony road now, don't forget the people that came before you and don't forget the struggle that is ours. Don't forget that there are a lot of people that are still struggling and don't forget that there are people who are trying to turn it around right now. It is very important for us to remember what our parents have done, to remember, and remember this. You know, things are really bad right now, but they've been worse. They've been worse. And one of the challenges I think you and I need to remember, racism has been worse than it is right now. But we were stronger as a people and I submit to you that one of the challenges is that we've got to get back to who we used to be and get back in touch with who grandma and them were and not forget what informs who we are. Are you with me? We are reminded. So, so Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, they're brought in. They're trained for three years. But they're being set up by God to be part of the answer. You and I need to remember that when God opens doors for you, it's not just for you. That particularly in this season, we all need to be asking, God, why have you placed me here? And what is, what, how am I part of your plan for the deliverance of our people? Can I, can I come real close here? I want to suggest to you that African Americans or black people in Philadelphia are in a bad way right now. This city is not kind to us. We, people want to live in Philadelphia. You do know that Philadelphia is called the buckle on the money belt uh, between D.C. and New York. During COVID, 
thousands of people left New York and even the D.C. area to move to our area because of the changing ways that you can work now. You know, you don't have to go all the time to work. You can work online. People want to live here. The property value is good. And the people are coming here for jobs because this is the city of meds, eds, and beds. There is economic opportunity around here. There is a reverse. I mean, right now, there is a reverse uh, rush hour on on any given morning that's coming out of the city going up to king of prussia and in the area i mean stuff is happening around here and people are living in the city it just seems that the economic opportunity and prosperity is missing the black community there was supposed to be a black owned a black owned luxury hotel right downtown and it just went away it was on the table and it just went away there was a black owned food chain or grocery store chain that came into Philadelphia that is booming in North Carolina and it came into Philadelphia and then it just went away. We had one right there on Chu and Washington. It started and then it just went away. There are forces at work in this city and I am convinced that there are systems that would seek to keep your people and my people in bondage and we got to call it and so for those of you and us that are in this room that have had some level of success or some measure of success we have to ask ourselves a question god why have you set me up and how does this equate to helping my people in this city what what are you using me for there is a challenge to all of us we still shouldn't be having firsts and onlys in our community. Are you with me? But my generation may have been some firsts and onlys, but our children shouldn't still be being firsts and onlys. Are you with me? So I want, I want to push on that. That's what the Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego story is about because God is going to save the Hebrew people but he's going to do it with some chosen people. Now, it's going to get uncomfortable here. A generation ago, or maybe two generations ago, we talked about this talented 10. That sounds elitist. It sounds, um, it sounds separatist. And I would argue that we're not necessarily looking for a talented 10th, but I would suggest to you that we're looking for a committed quorum. I would suggest to you that people from all walks of life, we're going to have to figure out how we work together for the elevation of our people. For those of us who have some uh, anointing, some level of success, some level of opportunity, every one of us has to ask the question, how can where I am translate into help for somebody else? God, why did you put me here? How can I lift somebody else? How can my excellence be an example? And can I push on that? Part of this, and this language makes us feel uncomfortable, but for some of us, your job is to show up and be excellent. And we have to create a culture that doesn't make excellent apologize. One of the things that happens in our community, and those of us do, you know, I, I do a lot of talking about sort of the mega church thing and 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 I kind of focus on that history because the ugly part of this story is my generation, we're raised in the traditional church. We come back home, did what they told us to do, went, got the degree, and then you come in and then you're back at the church and then silently, quietly, you get joked with about your degree. You get joked with. I know sometimes when I was a young preacher and you, you're invited to come preach and they said, well, give us your, give us your resume. You give them a resume um, or give, give you a bio. You give them the bio and they start reading it and they're going to introduce you. I ain't going to say all this. Well, all this don't really matter. All I can tell you, he's got a B.A. He's born again. 
and then you, you, start, you start feeling the shade. And I may be talking to somebody in here, you've worked hard to earn what you earn and do what you do, and you feel shade thrown at you when you're back with maybe some of your friends. One of the things that happen with the growth, and I'm not saying this is right, is just real. One of the things that happen is that a whole group of people who did not feel accepted in the African-American community or in the traditional black context, then you start moving out and moving around people who are of a similar ilk. And one of the things that happened with the prosperity gospel, even though it is a bastardized prosperity gospel, it's wrong. At least in the prosperity gospel, Bishop Hoppin' John was, was making it sound like Jesus had something to do with your success. Now, it was totally messed up, but people who were uh, moving up were tired of the shade from some and went around those who at least sort of made it feel like it's okay to be blessed. But then that fell off and, and got really weird because too many people began to sing, I bling because I'm happy, not I sing because I'm happy. And so then this prosperity gospel and people start going where everybody has things and then you have this church of haves and then church of have nots. But the history of the black church has always sort of been that way because we tend to not treat each other nicely. If you look at the history of the black church, you can see the, the people who belong to churches going from the more charismatic Pentecostal to the more connectional and liturgical, and you'll watch an education shift. So in the more charismatic Pentecostal, traditionally, way in the back, you'll have more of your uneducated, and then as you move up in education, you move closer to Presbyterian. Then there were also, when you go back before, you go a color line. So when they were uneducated and they tended to be uneducated and darker, and then you move on up and you find a light-skinned folk. Y'all gonna get mad at me. When I was in Denora, Pennsylvania, we had two black Baptist churches, St. Paul Baptist Church and First Baptist Church. St. Paul Baptist Church were the dark-skinned South Carolinians and First Baptist Church were the light-skinned Virginians. That's real. Historically, I'm not saying we're there. You know, one of the things about the Five Baby Sigma Fraternity Incorporated is the first is the first fraternity to get rid of the brown paper bag rule, uh, because all of y'all running around here with these letters know we belong to organizations that you go back about 75 years. If you did not have the right color skin, you could not get in them because we had this black white thing. This mess has been in our community. And it has caused us to throw shade at each other. And so I'm not saying that all uneducated people are bad or all dark-skinned people are ignorant and none of, none of that. I'm saying we've been in some mess. And what I am saying is that to get out of this mess, God will raise up some people. And if God raises you up and if you have access and if you have ability and if God has blessed you, it is not just for your own private consumption. It is not just so that you can get your own house or you get your own stuff and be happy with what you have. If God has opened a door in your life, Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, Abednego, it is because God wants to use you to help bring the rest of them along. And that's a challenge for all of us. Challenge to think about how do I use this moment? How do I use this moment to help my people? But here it is. But Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. And God gave Daniel favor and compassion in the sight of the chief of the eunuchs. And the chief of the eunuchs said to Daniel, I fear my lord, the king who assigned your food and your drink. For why should he see that you were in worse condition than the youths who are of your own age? So you would endanger my head with the king. Then Daniel said to the steward, whom the chief of the eunuchs had assigned over Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah, 
Test your servants for ten days. Let us be given vegetables to eat and water to drink. Then let our appearance and the appearance of the youths who eat the king's food be observed by you and deal with your servants accordingly to what you see. So he listened to them and in this manner and tested them for 10 days. And at the end of the 10 days, it was seen that they were better in appearance and fatter in flesh than all the youths who ate the king's food. So the steward took away their food and wine. They were drink and gave them vegetables. That's the Daniel fast. But what do we learn? We know we do the Daniel fast, but what do we learn from it? That part of being able to show up and be a blessing and part of being able to represent and to help our people get in trouble, waller, is we got to be healthy enough to do it. The whole thing with that, the, the, the Daniel fast doesn't begin as a, a, just a spiritual journey. I mean, it is a spiritual journey, but it's also very practical I don't need to be eating this, drinking this wine and eating this meat if I'm in this season. I'm not telling anybody don't drink wine. Well, don't drink too much. And I'm not saying that you have to stop eating meat. But what Daniel does teach us is that he says, if I'm going to show up, I need to be healthy. Daniel is also saying, I know who I am. And this ain't how we eat. This is not how we eat. One thing could be argued for us as African-American men. We need to get in touch with who we are as Africans because the food that is served to us over here and the food in the food deserts may be informing why we tend to have all of the high blood pressure and why we tend to be overweight and why we tend to have the prostate troubles and, and all of that. We need to talk about it. Talk about what we're putting in our bodies. Because you can have all the anointing in the world, but if you can't stand up, y'all going to get mad at me. The reality is we've got to take care of ourselves. Now think about, so the Daniel Fast begins as just about eating right and taking care of ourselves. You know, it's always funny to me when somebody tells me that their doctor said they can't eat healthy. No, I'm not doing it. My doctor said I can't. Your doctor, your, your, no, your doctor did not tell you that you can't eat healthy. Just say you don't want to do it. <laughs> Just say you don't want to do it. But this question of how we show up for our people, some of us have to think about, if I'm going to be a part of the answer, I need to be healthy. If I'm going to be part of the answer, I need to take care of myself. That's the question that we raise every communion. Are you sleeping? Are you eating in a healthy manner? Are you loving yourself and taking care of yourself? If you're going to be a part of the answer, God needs you to take, and we need you to take care of yourself. That's why we do the men's know your numbers. I mean, we have to be honest about the, the condition of black men and, and being overweight and having high blood pressure and the stuff that we eat. We've got to challenge ourselves, yes, press the system, because sometimes it is a systemic reality that we don't have access to the good stuff in, in our food deserts. But we also need to ask ourselves how we, what we choose to eat, when we choose to eat it, how we choose to eat it. The Daniel fast is first a reminder to us that if I'm going to be a part of the answer, I need to be healthy enough to respond to God's will and call in my life. Remember, as men, we said there are four B's that we need to be focusing on. That's our beliefs, our bonds, our bodies, and our business. My beliefs, what do I understand about God? My bonds, my relationships, my body, and my business. There is a part, it is an act of worship to take care of your body. And the bottom line for Daniel is he looked better when he ate better. Somebody is saying, I ain't come to Bible study to hear about eating. Give me some spiritual stuff. This is spiritual stuff. This is the practical stuff of being able to be a vet. Don't you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? If you really want to be used by God, give him something that he can work with. We tend to celebrate sick. We tend to celebrate overworking. We tend to celebrate 
exhausted. We tend to celebrate doing too much. And we, we, we celebrate it in our culture. And all of us, and on some level, this is pot calling kettle black in this moment. Because a lot of us overwork, don't get enough rest. My mind was blown when a nutritionist said to me, every time you go to sleep and you don't get seven to eight hours, whatever the minus of that seven, that's an hour off the other end of your life. We really weren't meant to live on six hours a night. And we weren't li meant to live without a pause each week. Are you with me? That was the teaching of this, of this Daniel fast. Now, he did it for 10 days. You do the Daniel fast as you feel led. We've done it for the 40 days, but it was literally 10 days. But what we usually forget about this, the Daniel fast is that 10 day thing. But the story says the Daniel fast was only to prove to the eunuch that he wasn't going to get in trouble. Remember this. When Daniel said to the eunuch, um, just give me fruits and um, water, the eunuch said to him, no, I ain't doing that because you're going to look sick because they were thinking that wine and meat was the best of the king's table. And so then the eunuch was saying to Daniel, no, no, you're going to have to eat this food because if you show up sick, Nebuchadnezzar going to kill me. So then Daniel said, no, I promise you, just give me fruit and and leafy greens and water just prove me for 10 days let's see who looks better the boys who are drinking this wine and eating this meat or me eating these leafy green vegetables not all this stuff that was created and we can say you know when we do the daniel fast it really wasn't intended to mean that we figured out how to make vegetable ice cream it wasn't intended, because you know, you can figure out, I mean, they got everything. Vegan carrot cake. It really wasn't intended to be, I'm not going to sacrifice. It was really intended to be vegetables, leafy green vegetables. And he said, now, after 10 days, look at who looks better. So at the end of 10 days, they were like, wow. You are fairer and fatter, and the fatter doesn't mean fat as we understand it. Because you're probably not going, you're not going to be as, in our language, fat drinking uh, water and vegetables as the person who's eaten prime rib and Mogan David. And so you're going to look, but you're going to look better. I promise you, you, you look better when you got vegetables in your system than you do when you got fat in your system. You look better when you've been drinking water than when you've been drinking Hennessy. You look better. That's just true. And here's the rest of the story. So after, the, after he proved it, it's like, oh yeah, you look better. So then for the rest of his life, this wasn't just 40 days. For the rest of his life, wasn't just for 10 days. The 10 days was to prove it. Now Daniel said, now just give me my water and give me my vegetables, and this is going to be my lifestyle. Y'all just got quiet on me. Some of us have learned. Now, I'm not telling you, I'm not telling you can't never eat meat again. I'm not to eat what you want to eat. I'm just saying if you want to stay around here a little while, you might want to have more vegetables and more water in your system than fatty meat and wine. Uh, it got uncomfortable here. As for these four youths, God gave them learning and skill in all literature and wisdom, and Daniel had understanding in all visions and dreams. These young men had different skills, but all of it was necessary for the deliverance of their people. Some of them skill in literature and in wisdom, and Daniel had all understanding in visions and in dreams. 
And at the end of the time, when the king had commanded that they should be brought in, the chief of the eunuchs brought them in before Nebuchadnezzar. And the king spoke with them, and among all of them, none was found like Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Therefore, they stood before the king. Now, the standing before the king is important because it means they were in place. Some of us need to recognize that God has crafted your life so that you would be in place. Some stuff doesn't happen with the shouting in the streets. Somebody has to be in place. Somebody has to be in place to interpret the shouting of the streets. And don't get me wrong, there's a pla- there is a place for marches and there is a place. But do we remember the, w- the last time when you march on the Pettus Bridge, that's because somebody is inside like Adam Clayton Powell saying we need a Voting Rights Act. When you go up to Washington, it means somebody also has to be inside working on a civil rights bill. When you stop or walk mar- marching, when you stop riding the buses, somebody has to be at the table with the White Citizens Council be- and beginning to talk about the changes that are going to be made uh, on the buses. We tend to want to just be loud in the streets, but we got to make sure we got somebody in at the table interpreting the streets and saying, this is what we need. And I'm talking to somebody tonight that God has orchestrated your life. Don't be ashamed of it, but recognize you're in that place and you're one of few because you're supposed to speak up. You're in that place not to protect yourself, to trust that God is going to protect you, but speak up. Let people know. Make sure you pull somebody else up in it. Make sure that you are a blessing. Make sure that you're looking out for the children. Make sure that you're looking out for people. See if I can make this thing play. We had a meeting on last Friday. Um, The the mayor called a meeting uh, right after all the shootings, and there was just a bunch of people from around. And we went around and we uh, said who we are, introducing in the room. So when it came to me, and I stood up and I said, my name is Alan Waller. I'm the assistant wrestling coach at Martin Luther King High School. And then some people started to chuckle because um, they wanted me to say, you know, e- pass an email. But what I was trying to say in the room, it, it really doesn't matter if it doesn't translate to these kids. It really, whatever your title is does not matter if it does not translate into how you touch young people. It does not, it doesn't matter what your position is if you haven't uh, hooked on into the assignment that you have to help our people. What am I trying to say and why am I trying to say it? As we walk through the book of Daniel, we're going to see a lot of imagery. There's going to be connections with the book of Revelation. God gives visions about what is going to happen in the earth. God uses Daniel and Daniel Uh, ministers the entire time of the Babylonian captivity until King Cyrus, um, as you'll see in verse 21, and Daniel was there until the first year of King Cyrus. Some of us have been called to be in the place where you are. It's uncomfortable. You feel alone, but you're called there to be excellent You're called there to show up healthy. You're called there to represent the best of who we are. Do you know one of the reasons why, and I I bless God for this church, 15 years ago when we refinanced and we decided we're going to put some real effort into that football field over there because we're going to focus on our children. And Doing that football field took us dangerously low in our cash reserves. But we said the football team and youth ministry is very important. But here's the other, here's the other part of it. We got a turf field, manicured field. And do you know what part of that is? Not just for the safety of the kids. Part of that is when people from the county know that they have to go to Philly to play a game. I get excited when white folk have to see that we have just as nice stuff. You didn't expect to see it. Now that might sound, I don't know what it sounds like to you, but part of the ministry 
is to remind you, just because you come to Philly does not mean you come in the people that don't have anything, that don't have any respect for themselves. Listen, this is a gateway from the county, and we want you to know you're coming into a beautiful people, a beautiful community, and we are both reminding them and saying to the rest of our community, now come on, y'all, let's, let's get up. And not get up for them, but get up for ourselves because we know who God has called us to be. That's who Daniel, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are. And we're getting ready to see their stories because Daniel is going to have to not bow down and it's going to get him in trouble. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego are going to have to not bow down and it's going to get them in trouble. You may find yourself wrestling with, will you please God or please man in your service this week on your job? And it could get you in trouble. But the same God who gets Daniel out of a lion's den, who gets the three Hebrew boys out of a furnace flame, will be able to keep you in that corporation, will be able to keep you in your place so that you can be a blessing to others. Listen, that, that's what I got for you tonight. And I want to challenge you to think about what you've been called to. But I'm going to ask us to stand to our feet. And I want to honor our time. I want to honor our time. I want us to close with some prayer circles like we normally do. But I'm going to ask you if you would get in groups of seven. If we'd get in groups of seven. Because we need to pray. Groups of seven. Just find seven people around you. Just find seven people around you. Our city is in trouble, but we are going to win. Our country is in trouble, but we are going to win. I'm going to ask if you would just speak into the circle the thing that concerns you or the thing that is on your heart tonight. And then I'm going to ask the person in that circle who feels led to pray for the circle. I'm just going to ask, though, put your prayer request in your circle. And the person who feels led to pray for that circle, you're going to ask, I'm going to ask you to begin to pray. I'm going to come in in just a few moments and close us out in prayer. But I want to name this. I want to name that our children are hurting. I want to name that our children need us to step up and step in. They want us as parents. I want to name that some of our parents are frustrated and doing what they know to do and doing the best that they can. I want to name that we do have an enemy, Satan, and that systemic injustice is real. I want to name those things, but I also want to claim victory that we can win and that we will win and that we are going to see the salvation of our, our Lord. We're going to see something different for our children. Would you speak into your circle and then would you begin to pray? After a while, I'll close us out in prayer.
The trump shall resound, and the Lord shall descend, even so it is well with my soul. my soul it is well it is well with my soul and Lord haste the day my faith shall be signed. The clouds be rolled back as a scroll. The trump shall Even so, it is well with my soul. It is well, hallelujah, with my soul. God, we bless you and we thank you, oh God. We thank you for word and worship. We thank you for calling us together tonight. We thank you, God, for your word that reminds us you're calling us out to represent. Lord, we hear you calling us to health and to calling us to a commitment to you, oh God. We recognize, God, for some of us, you've opened doors, but it wasn't just for us alone, God. But you've opened doors that we might be a blessing to someone else. Lord, help us to understand why you have us, where you have us. Lord, for somebody under the sound of my voice, Lord, they're feeling uh, that they're, the attack is happening on them, God, that trouble is hitting them and is not moving away. But Lord, help us to understand what you're doing in that moment and how we can adjust to your will that in our lives you would get glory and it would be for our good. Now, God, as we get ready to leave this place, Lord, but never from your saving grace. Lord, give us traveling grace until we meet again. We ask it in the matchless, marvelous, and majestic name of Jesus the Christ. And for his sake we do pray. Let every heart say amen, amen, and amen. Come on, give the Lord a hand of praise. Thank you. Amen, amen, amen. Would you give somebody whatever is comfortable to you as a greeting? Give them a high five. Give them a half clap. Give them a hug if you're not afraid. Amen. With my soul, it is well. It is well. With 